Hi, welcome back for another few minutes in New Zealand. In the last lesson, lesson 5.1, uh, we learned that Weka only helps you with a small part of the overall data mining process, the technical part, which is perhaps the easy part. And in this lesson, we're going to learn that there are many pitfalls and pratfalls uh, even in that part. So we just define for you a pitfall as a hidden or unsuspected danger or difficulty. And there are plenty of those in the field of machine learning. And a pratfall is a stupid and humiliating action, which it's very easy to do when you're working with data. So the first lesson is that you should be skeptical. In data mining, it's very easy to cheat. Whether you're cheating consciously or unconsciously, it's easy to mislead yourself or mislead others about the significance of your results. For a reliable test, you should use a completely fresh sample of data that has never been seen before. You should save something for the very end that you don't use until you've selected your algorithm, you've decide, decided how you're going to apply it and the filters and so on. Then at the very, very end, having done all that, run it on some fresh data to get an estimate of how it will perform. And don't be tempted to then change it to improve it so that you get better results on that data. Always do your final run on fresh data. I mean, we've talked a lot about overfitting, and this is basically the same kind of problem. Of course, you know not to test on the training set. Uh, we've talked about that endlessly throughout this course. Data that's been used for development in any way is tainted. Any time you use some data to help you make a choice of the filter or the classifier or how you're going to treat your, your problem, then that data is, is kind of tainted. You should be using completely fresh data to get evaluation results. Leave some evaluation data aside for the very end of the process. That's the first piece of advice. Another thing I haven't told you about in this uh, course so far is missing values. In real data sets, it's very common that some of the uh, data values are missing. They haven't been recorded. They might be unknown, they might, we might have forgotten to record them, they might be irrelevant. And uh, there are two basic strategies for dealing with missing values in a data set. You can omit instances where the attribute value is missing, or somehow find a way of omitting that particular attribute in that instance. Or you can treat missing as a separate possible value. So you need to ask yourself, is there significance in the fact that the value is missing? You know, they say if you've got something wrong with you and go to the doctor and he does some tests on you, if you just record the tests that he does, not the results of the tests, but just the ones he chooses to do, then there's a very good chance you can work out what's wrong with you, just from the existence of the tests, not from their results. That's because the doctor chooses tests intelligently the fact that he doesn't choose a test doesn't mean that that value is kind of missing or accidentally not there. There's huge significance in the fact that he's chosen not to do certain tests. So this is a situation where missing should be treated as a separate possible value. There's significance in the value, the fact that a value is missing. But in other situations, a value might be missing simply because a piece of equipment malfunctioned or for some other reason someone forgot something. And then there's no significance uh, in, uh, in the fact that it's missing. So pretty well all machine learning algorithms deal with missing values. In an ARF file, if you put a question mark as a data value, that's treated as a missing value. And uh, all, machine, all methods in Weka can deal with missing values. But they make different assumptions about them. So if you don't appreciate this, then it's easy to get misled. So let me just uh, take two simple and well-known to us examples, 1R and J48. They deal with missing values in different ways. I'm going to load the nominal weather data. and Let me just run 1R on it to get 42.8, 43%. Let me run J48 on it to get 50%. At the top here. Now I'm going to just edit this data set 
Uh, I'm going to change the outlook, the value of outlook, for the first four no instances, I'm going to change this value to missing. That's how we do it here in this editor. If we were to write this file out in ARF format, we would find that these four values were written in as question marks. So now if we look at Outlook, which we are doing, you can see that it says here there are four missing values. And if you count up these labels, two, four, and four, that's uh, ten, 10 labels. So another four to make the 14 instances are missing. All right, let's go back to J48 and run it again. And we still get 50%, same kind of result. Of course, this is a tiny data set, but the fact is that it's unaffected. The results here are unaffected by the fact that a few of the values are missing. However, if we run 1R, I get a much higher accuracy, 93% accuracy. 93%. And the rule that I've got is branch on Outlook, which is what we had before, I think. And here it's saying there's four possibilities. If it's sunny, it's a yes. If it's overcast, it's a yes. If it's rainy, it's a yes. And if it's missing, it's a no. So here, 1R is using the fact that a value is missing as significant as something you can branch on. Whereas if you were to look at a J48 tree, it would never branch on. It would never have a branch that corresponded to a missing value. So it treats them differently. That's uh, very important to know and remember. And the final thing I want to tell you about in this lesson is the no free lunch theorem. There's no free lunch in data mining. So here's a way to illustrate it. Supposing you've got a two-class problem with 100 binary attributes. And let's say you've got a huge training set with a million instances in their classifications in the training set. So the number of possible uh, instances is 2 to the 100 there are 100 binary attributes. And you know 10 to the 6 of them. So you don't know the classes of 2 to the 100 minus 10 to the 6 examples. Now let me tell you that 2 to the 100 minus 10 to the 6 is as near as down at 2 to the 100. It's 99.999% of 2 to the 100. So there's a huge number of examples you just don't know the classes of. How could you possibly figure them out? If you apply a data mining scheme to this, it will figure them out. But how can you possibly figure out all of those uh, things just from the tiny amount of data that you've been given. In order to generalize, every learner must embody some knowledge or assumptions beyond the data it's given. And each learning algorithm implicitly provides a set of assumptions. The best way to think about those assumptions is to think back to the boundary visualizer we looked at in lesson 4.1. You saw that different machine learning schemes are capable of drawing different kind of boundaries in instance space. And these boundaries correspond to a set of assumptions about the sorts of, of decisions that we can make. So there is no universal best algorithm. There's no free lunch. There's no single best algorithm. Data mining is an experimental science. And that's why we've been teaching you how to experiment with data mining yourself. So this is just a summary. Uh, be skeptical. Uh, when people tell you about data mining results, they say there's this kind of accuracy, then to be sure about that, you want to have them test their classifier on your new, fresh data that they've never seen before. Overfitting has many faces. Different learning schemes make different assumptions about missing values, which can really change the result. There is no universal best learning algorithm. Data mining is an experimental science, and it's very easy to be misled by people quoting the results of data mining experiments. Okay, that's it for now. Off you go and do the, the activity, and uh, we'll see you in the next lesson. Bye for now.